Good morning. This is Block 4, Section 4's lecture on was the American Revolution uh, a radical revolution or was it a very strange thing in history, a conservative uh, revolution? Did the American Revolution kind of overturn pre existing um, roles and situations and institutions of uh, society or did the American Revolution merely seek uh, to conserve those things against something that was trying to take them away? Uh, it's a fascinating question. The American Revolution is unique. Uh, in history in a lot of different ways. It's one of the very few revolutions, or one of the that I can think of, uh, that did not end in uh, bloodshed worse than it was, um, than it started. Most revolutions, it said, eat their own children. You know, in the French Revolution, you had uh, the terror and the guillotine and the Committee of Public Safety, and the Russian Revolution ended in the gulag, and uh, the Chinese Revolution and the Greek Great Leap Forward, and all these catastrophic disasters uh, for the countries that went through these revolutions. Uh, and the American Revolution is different, that after the American Revolution, uh, the United States set out on this path of relative peace and prosperity for the next 230 years. Um, obviously not every single year or decade, but by and large, uh, the American Revolution is seen in the United States as an unalloyed good thing, and that's... Not simply the case in other revolutions around the world. So let's let's start by looking and seeing. Let, let's let's take some arguments uh, that the American Revolution was a conservative revolution, um, with the very traditional sense of the word conservative, not in the sense of the word conservative um, as in the modern Republican Party, but that it was actively seeking to try to conserve something. Uh, and if we answer yes to that question, we have to identify what was trying to be conserved and how successful were the people who fought the American Revolution at conserving what they were trying uh, to conserve. So, so arguments in favor that the American Revolution was a conservative revolution. Number one, the leadership of the country at the beginning of the uh, war was exactly the same as the leadership country at the end. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams and James Madison and Thomas Paine and George Washington and Ben Franklin, the colonial elite at the beginning of the war, were the American elite at the end of the war, uh, by and large. That there, we are not overthrowing um, the people who are running America in 1775 are still the people that are running America in 1783. Um, yes, we've gotten ring rid of the, the, this distant rule uh, by Parliament, but in reality, if you look at colonial America, colonial America was run by the colonists themselves. Um, and that's really the cause, or one of the main causes of the revolution was Great Britain trying to come in and retake control. Uh, so the, if you looked at the makeup of the American elite at the beginning of the war, and at the end of the war, you're looking at the same people. Uh, Many, many, many people attended both the uh, Second Continental Congress and signed the Declaration of Independence and then went and signed the Constitution 13 years later, um, or excuse me, 11 years later. Um, that's unusual. We were So one way that you can look at this is that these this colonial elite was trying to conserve its position of elite. Um, and in looking at it like that, they certainly succeeded. Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, George Washington, the whole crew, um, was in charge of America after the war, just like they were uh, before. Most Americans, if you would ask them why they were fighting, especially at the beginning, in 1775, why were those Minutemen in Massachusetts taking up their arms? It was not necessarily for independence, but it was to restore a fundamentally conservative word. It was to restore... Uh, their traditional, there's another conservative word, restore their traditional rights as Englishmen. Um, that a overweening and overpowerful king and parliament uh, were taking away from them. And that independence was merely the means to restore those traditional rights. Um, and you had to have independence to do it because the king and the parliament were violating those rights. Um, so this is a very conservative thing. We are restoring traditional rights. Um, is an art, and that was the case. That um, if you look at the traditional, you know, rights that are considered to be English rights, trial by jury, free, um, you know, freedom of speech, grow, uh, freedom to criticize the government, um, 
you know, the government cannot, uh, has limited powers. Um, all of these rights are restored, kept, and institutionalized uh, in the American Revolution. No American institutions are overthrown uh, during the American Revolution. That um, there is no established church throughout the colonies. There is no um, there is no overthrowing of the slave power. There is no overthrowing of the poor people of the South. They are they're not overthrowing the elite planters. The uh, the common wage earners and small farmers in New England are not overthrowing the commercial and mercantile interests uh, of New England. So no American institutions are being overthrown. In fact, a lot of American institutions are becoming leaders uh, in, or they're staying leaders. The Virginia House of Burgesses meets uh, from the beginning of the war all the way to the end. That the Massachusetts General Court, their, um, their legislature meets from the very beginning to the very end of the war. That nothing changes uh, in these American institutions. There's no violent terror. Um, no one got their head cut off. Um, let alone thousands of people like in the French Revolution and millions of people like in the Russian and Chinese Revolutions lost their lives because of this. Um, even the Loyalists who were um, the enemy of anyone who was fighting for independence, the worst thing that happened to them was they had their estates taken and they were kind of forced to flee town. Yeah, it sucks to be them, uh, but there is no wide-scale slaughter of opponents of the regime like there will be uh, in revolutions throughout uh, f from history from that point forward. Property is respected throughout the course of this revolutionary period. We have no, nothing hap nothing that typically when we think of revolutions, all the poor peasants are rising up against, you know, the elites and overthrowing them. That does not happen in the American Revolution. The American Revolution starts with a elite leadership. This elite leadership carries them through uh, the entire war and constitution making and emerges as the leadership at the end. So what were they conserving? Um, that it can be argued that the whole point of this revolution was to conserve their status as elites. <coughs> Excuse me. And the way to do that was to conserve their property. That property was, property rights were considered fundamental to liberty by the founders. That if a man did not have the ability to keep what he owned, to earn the sweat of his brow, to earn his bread, uh, then you could not have liberty. For the founders, liberty and property are two sides of the same coin. That you cannot have one without the other. That without my ability to keep what I earn or without my ability to own my own land, I cannot possibly be free. Um, this word, liberty, was kind of on the lips of all of the founders as they started the American Revolution, that they were fighting, as they saw it, for their liberty, to retain their liberty. Liberty in and of itself is a conservative idea. The way the founders thought of liberty was that liberty is a space in which no one can hold authority over you. And that's an intensely conservative belief that no government, no institutions can infringe upon your desire to do as you will in that space. Words like liberty, freedom was not what was talked about in the American Revolution. The word that they used was liberty. The ability to do what they wanted in those spheres where no authority could touch them. Um, and that is the key thing that makes this a conservative revolution in this point of view. That the idea was to keep, keep government out of people's rights. To make the sphere of liberty as big as possible. Um, and is it true that the elites respected property, um, maintained property throughout the war? Yes, absolutely it is. Through the making of the Constitution, yes, absolutely it is. Um, but they were doing so in an attempt to make sure that that sphere of liberty, the role of liberty, could be as big as possible um, in the country that they helped found. And that is what makes it, in this view, a conservative revolution. What makes it a radical revolution? Well, there's a lot of counter-arguments here. Number one, the foundational state.
statement of the American Revolution. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. When else in history has a country come out and said that? That in and of itself is one of the most radical statements that a person can make. Look around. People are clearly, in so many obvious ways, unequal. We are all not, we don't have the same intelligence. We are not similarly athletic or good looking or smart or personable or tall or short or fat or thin. Look around. We are brilliantly unequal. But for Thomas Jefferson to say, hey, all people, that's what he meant. All people are created equal in the eyes of God. Everyone has equal human dignity is an incredibly radical statement. It's a radical statement in America, 1776. In a world where three million people, he's, or he's dead, that's by the Civil War, by half a million people in 1776 are kept as chattel slaves. In a sense, it's hypocritical. Yes, Thomas Jefferson, all men are created equal. And he goes home and he has slaves. Yes, we all know that. We get it. But he wrote something so radical and so change-worthy and so, that when it came time to defeat slavery and to argue against slavery, all you had to use was Jefferson's radical words against the institution of slavery. If all men are created equal, then by definition, how can you possibly own chattel slaves? The institution of slavery itself is harmed by the American Revolution. It is not abolished. We know that. It took a whole other titanic war to abolish slavery. But slavery as an institution is harmed. That a lot of people in the United States look and they look at Thomas Jefferson's words and they look at the institution of slavery and they say you cannot possibly juxtapose those two things. Those two things cannot possibly go together. You cannot have a country where all men are created equal on one hand and in a country where slavery thrives in the other, people in the revolutionary period begin arguing against slavery on moral grounds, on patriotic grounds, that patriotic Americans, because they believe in liberty, cannot possibly believe in slavery. That is an argument that begins to be made. That is a radical argument. The strange, keep something in mind, my friends, the strange thing in history is not slavery. Slavery is the normal thing in history. Abolishing slavery is the strange thing in history. The revolution, again, on a radical note, had a leveling effect throughout society. That the society that grew up after the revolution didn't had much less in the way of, except in the South, the South's always unequal. But up in the North, in the mid-Atlantic states especially, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, where there were large gaps of wealth, before the revolution, those gaps were much smaller after. And a lot of that had to do with the, um, the taking of loyalist uh, property and redistributing it uh, to soldiers. Uh, but the idea of liberty led to laws that helped people own their own land, led to laws that helped people establish themselves in communities and become voting free citizens. And that leveling effect that democratizing effect that happened throughout the northern part of the country was fairly radical. Normally, as time goes on, wealth becomes more and more unequal, but in the United States in the Revolutionary Period, that wealth was becoming more equal. Even the language reflected a radical change in how people thought. The word Mr. became popular that any man in the country could refer to any other as Mr. That John Adams was Mr. Adams. Thomas Jefferson was Mr. Jefferson. Joe Schmo on his farm in the back country of North Carolina was Mr. Smith. That is that leveling effect. The idea that you do not have your betters, who you have to call sir or sire or lord, my liege, my lord, that is gone in America uh, in, the rev in the revolutionary period. John Adams is Mr. Adams. Joe Schmo is Mr. Schmo. And that assumes a level of equality, which is radical in its, um, in its effects. The way people greeted each other. Um, before this, if there was somebody who was your better, you would bow to them. And then they would kind of incline their head to say, hey, you know, I recognize that you bowed to me. The new custom of shaking hands 
emerged in America. A handshake is something that by definition is between equals. Uh, this idea of all men are created equal leads to this leveling effect, leads to changes in language uh, and in social customs as simple as the, the handshake. Um, George Washington as president still bowed. He was a formal guy. But by the time John Adams is inaugurated in 1797, John Adams is shaking the hands of all the citizens of the country when they meet him. Um, other things that happened that were radical. Primogeniture and entail were gone. The idea that only the oldest sons uh, of family should inherit land is out. Land is now going to be equally divided in all the states of the country. Throughout the new 13 states, throughout the new country, churches are disestablished all over. Um, that at the end of the Revolutionary War, that the Congregational Church was the established church in Massachusetts, the Anglican Church was the established church in most, most uh, of the Southern colonies, the Reformed Church was the established church of New York. By the time the Constitution, by 1800, by kind of the end of the Revolutionary period, by 1800, all of these churches have been disestablished and religious freedom reigns in all of the states of the country. That is radical. Um, so to sum this up, I think you can say this. On the surface, on the surface, it's a conservative revolution. The leaders at the beginning are the leaders at the end. Property is respected throughout. There's no violent overthrow of any existing institutions. But underneath all of that continuity is a sea change. More and more Americans are going to argue against slavery on moral grounds. There is a nationwide leveling effect that no one man is better by his birth than anybody else. That everybody deserves to be called Mr. Everybody deserves to have their hands shook when they are greeted. There's less recognition that there are some people in society that are just your betters and that you owe them a tip of the hat, a bow of the head um, at any point in time. That in America, and this is very radical, in America all men can go around you know, with their heads held high saying that they are an independent person of independent means using their liberty uh, to enhance their station in life. So. I would say, I would argue, if you had to ask me, that on the surface it is a conservative revolution, uh, but underneath there are some very vital sea changes going on that do change American society in a lot of fundamental ways by the time the revolutionary period was over.